This is Treasure Island, the classic adventure story by Robert Louis Stevenson that launched a thousand pirate ships. It's a stunningly awesome book, so good that it remains a completely addictive page-turner, even after 150 years of every author under the sun stripping it down for spare parts. And it all started with this. The map of Treasure Island itself. In my first book, Stevenson tells the origin story of Treasure Island, which begins when he was a lodger at the late Miss McGregor's cottage. One of Stevenson's roommates at the cottage was an artist who would spend afternoons at the easel, and Stevenson would periodically join him in creating art. On one such occasion, Stevenson, well, actually, I'll let Robert speak for himself. I made a map of the island. It was elaborately, and I thought, beautifully colored. The shape of it took my fancy beyond expression. It contained harbors that pleased me like sonnets, and with the unconsciousness of the predestined, I ticketed my performance, Treasure Island. I am told that there are people who do not care for maps and find it hard to believe. The names, the shapes of the woodlands, the courses of the roads and rivers, the prehistoric footsteps of man still distinctly traceable uphill and down dale, the mills and the ruins, the ponds and the ferries, perhaps the standing stone of the druidic circle on the heath. Here is an inexhaustible fund of interest for any man with eyes to see or two pence worth of imagination to understand with. No child but must remember laying his head in the grass, staring into the infinitesimal forest and seeing it grow populous with fairy armies. Somewhat in this way, as I paused upon my map of Treasure Island, the future characters of the book began to appear visibly there among imaginary woods, and their brown faces and bright weapons peeped out upon me from unexpected quarters as they passed to and fro, fighting and hunting treasure on these few square inches of a flat projection. Sadly, this map is not the map that Stevenson drew that day. Much later, when he had finished writing Treasure Island, he submitted the map along with the manuscript to his publisher. Unfortunately, the map was lost in the post, or maybe the publisher misplaced it. Either way, Stevenson was horrified. He had to recreate the map from memory with great difficulty because he also had to comb through his own text to make sure the continuity was correct with the new version of the map. In this, Stevenson was kind of reversing the process by which he'd written the novel in the first place. I had written it up to the map. The map was the chief part of my plot. For instance, I had called an islet Skeleton Island, not knowing what I meant, seeking only for the immediate picturesque. And it was to justify this name that I broke into the gallery of Mr. Poe and stole Flint's pointer. And in the same way, it was because I made two harbors that the Hispaniola was sent on her wanderings with Israel hands. Whether it's the dim recesses of a dungeon, the vasty wilds of a hex map, or the starlit expanse of a traveler sector map, I have often found myself peering at a published map and felt my eyes drawn down into enigma. If I stepped onto that street, what would I see? What strange mysteries lie beneath those mounds? What secrets are hidden within the silver wood? One of my favorite examples of this is the world map from Monty Cook's Numenera. The unnatural curve of the clock of Kala and the impossible scale of the great slab demand an explanation from our imagination. And I don't know how anyone can look at the Kakillian jungle or the cloud crystal sky field and not want to immediately mount an expedition of either the mind or the gaming table to discover what lies within. If you're looking for another world of wonders to visit, don't miss out on Victoriana from Cubicle 7 Games, the sponsor of today's video. It's 1887, the year of Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, and the Second Great Age of Sorcery is over. Strange bands of heroes known as the Irregulars have risen up to guard the Empire against her many enemies, both mortal and otherwise. It's a world where Robert Louis Stevenson himself might be walking the streets, with real treasure maps waiting to guide the players to new adventures. In crafting adventures like these, and many others, I have often found myself more metaphorically walking in Stevenson's footsteps, beginning not with an outline or a scene list, but by seizing graph paper and letting creativity flow through the geography. But this is not, of course, the only way to begin an adventure. I'm just as likely to start with a revelation list, for example, as described in the Three Clue Rule. But take a dungeon, for example. While you could start with a list of rooms, you can just as easily start with a map. 
an interesting arrangement of chambers invites the imagination to fill them. And you'll find encounters peeping out at you from between the grid lines, just like Stevenson's pirates peep out from amongst the trees. The same is true of a wilderness map. My hand charted the contours of the Silverwood before I ever learned what might lie beneath its boughs. As Alfred Korsbisky said, the map is not the territory. When dealing with representations of reality, we cannot capture all the complexities of reality in our representations of it. There is a vast wealth of detail that can never be captured that way. But when it comes to imaginary creation, the meaning is almost inverted. The representation of the map is all that exists because the details have not yet been created by you. But that howling void will, like any vacuum, suck you down into it, with the map providing a lattice on which all the detail of the world can spill out. All we need to do is accept the invitation. And remember, whether we're talking about our maps or our adventure keys, that there is always more to our imaginary world than can be written on the page. The great thing about a role-playing game, of course, is that we have the opportunity to step beyond the page and to actually live in these wondrous worlds. So you should never be afraid to transcend your prep, whether it's cartographical or encounter building, while running the game. I'll let Mr. Stevenson have the final word here. I have said the map was most of the plot. I might almost say it was the whole. It is perhaps not often that a map figures so largely in a tale, yet it is always important. It is my contention, my superstition, if you like, that who is faithful to his map and consults it and draws from it inspiration daily and hourly gains positive support and not mere negative immunity from accident. The tale has a root there. It grows in that soil. It has a spine of its own behind the words. Better if the country be real and he has walked every foot of it and knows every milestone. But even with imaginary places, he will do well in the beginning to provide a map as he studies it, relations will appear that he had not thought upon. He will discover obvious, though unsuspected, shortcuts and footprints for his messengers. And even when the map is not all the plot, as it was in Treasure Island, it will be found to be a mine of suggestion. Don't forget to click the link in the uh, font of all knowledge below to visit Robert Louis Stevenson in Victoriana. It's on Kickstarter until August 7th, so you don't want to miss out. We've already unlocked several stretch goals, and I've got my fingers crossed for the player introduction written up as a penny dreadful. That, that just sounds awesome. Good gaming. This is Justin Alexander, and I'll see you at the table.